Well, thank you all. I'm so excited to dig into the discussion today. So let's go ahead and get started. I think we've got a, a pretty good group to begin. I am Ursula Knutson Latta with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. As you may know, FCNL coordinates the Prevention and Protection Working Group, or PPWG, as a, a coalition of over 200 experts and organizations dedicated to preventing genocide and mass atrocities. PPWG was instrumental in passing the Ellie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocity Prevention Act, and now holds regular consultations with the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force to ensure its full implementation and for early action to prevent potential atrocities and uh, atrocity events and to promote peace. However, as we all know, too often the United States only intervenes in violent conflict after the death of too many civilians, largely failing to prevent mass atrocities from occurring. However, with a new administration and Congress, we have the opportunity for a new direction a new approach to preventing mass atrocities. Today's discussion was prompted by the release of a new Win Without War report that provides a framework to do just that and change how the US approaches insecurity and violence writ large. It outlines ways to address the complex and interlocking challenges that threaten human security in this century. And in today's conversation, we'll be focusing on how Congress and the new administration can change the US approach to the Sahel as a case study to apply this broader approach to atrocity prevention. You can find this exciting new report on www.winwithoutwar.org. So we'll begin with a short panel discussion and then open for questions. As the panelists provide remarks, I encourage you to drop questions in the chat. We'll be reviewing them as we go and be ready for a great discussion at the end. So to begin, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Kate Kaiser, who will break down the report and its key recommendations for us. Kate is the policy director at Win Without War, and she has nearly a decade of experience working on human rights, democratization, and US foreign policy in the Middle East. Kate previously served as director of policy and advocacy at the Yemen Peace Project, and as US advocacy officer for Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. She has also held leadership roles in the private sector and on political campaigns. She has a BA in Middle Eastern and North African Studies from UCLA and an MA in Democracy and Governance from Georgetown. Kate, over to you. Thanks so much, Ursula. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. I know it's a really busy week. Everything seems to be happening at the same time, as always here in Washington, DC, where I am right now. Um, I'm ex super excited to be presenting our new report um, which is called From Building Bombs to Building Futures. It presents a framework for centering mass atrocity prevention in a diplomacy first foreign policy for the United States. But before we dig into the key findings and their implications for US policy in the Sahel, I wanna give a shout out to the report's lead author, Caroline Smith, who led the research and drafting of this report when she was a Herbert J. Scoville Peace Fellow with Win Without War Education Fund in the before times. Um, she unfortunately couldn't be here with us today, but I wanted to thank her for her leadership in creating this important report. We wrote this report because one of the key instances when the public calls for US military intervention is when a mass atrocity arises. We want to know why discussions around atrocity prevention in Washington in particular have revolved around two options in the face of mass atrocity of violence. It's often about either taking military action or doing quote unquote nothing. And despite the US government's stated prioritization of atrocity prevention as a core national security priority, our research shows that the US approach has been largely reactive, ineffective, and in many cases harmful. We reviewed the cases of three previous US interventions to prevent mass atrocities. The first was election related violence in Kenya in 2007. The mass atrocities committed in Syria by the Syrian government, as well as Russian and Iranian forces since 2011 is the second case. And the third case is the 2017 genocide of the Rohingya in Burma. In only one case in Kenya, was the US intervention effective in helping halt the cycle of violence? But even in that case, the US approach remained reactive, only responding once violence broke out and was largely only effective because of the 
the US leaned into its role as an amplifier of local civil society and community leader demands who were already organizing in Kenya and regionally to mitigate the violence before the US took any action. It is this crisis management approach, which has been reinforced by the securitization of US foreign policy over the last 20 years and our short term political cycles in which we make decisions that has directly led to a minimization of development, diplomatic and other tools that can help address the conditions that give rise to violence in the first place, which is often a primary precursor to the outbreak of a mass atrocity. It's time to flip this approach on its head and focus on reforming the US approach to violent writ large if we actually want to prevent atrocities as we say we do. We propose that centering conflict prevention and peace building in United States foreign policy requires a fundamental shift in how policymakers think about the US role in the world. It requires the US to focus on long term outcomes that are not dictated by US military interests. So US policy can help create and support local civil society and communities to, and help them build resilience and sustainable peace. Thankfully, the US government doesn't have to start from scratch. The US has already invested in core atrocity prevention tools that focus on prediction, prevention, and accountability for mass atrocities that can be expanded upon. And the passage of laws like the Global Fragility Act in the last Congress shows that there is bipartisan interest in this approach. I also think it's important to remember that the US is already spending billions in the form of counterterrorism operations, security cooperation and assistance to try to prevent violence. And we've seen for the last 20 years, the disastrous results some of those interventions have created. The cases of the Rohingya Bur Bur genocide in Burma and the US approach to the Syrian war reveal the pitfalls of this approach. Atrocities were not prevented in Burma in part because of the Obama administration's equation of liberalization with true democratic change and it perceived containing China as more important than punishing the Burmese military on civilian control of the government of the military and human rights. In Syria, despite a CIA study that said otherwise, the US fueled conflict by flooding the country with weapons through train and equip programs while disengaging from the international disem process. One reason we want to focus this event on the Sahel in releasing this report is because prediction indicators show the region is at high risk of a mass atrocity, in part because of the climate crisis, the tr true existential threat of our lifetimes, and the US has the opportunity to change its approach and play a more constructive role. To do so, we identified three key priorities for US policy in the Sahel. The first, is to end current US military assistance to the region and align diplomatic and peace building prevention efforts with the demands of local civil society and community leaders. Thankfully, civil society and local communities in the Sahel are already organizing and they've issued documents like the four pillars issued by the People's Coalition for the Sahel that represents a broad alliance of local and international organizations working on the ground to build sustainable peace and mitigate further violence in the region. Additionally, France is currently in the lead, quote unquote, military role in the Sahel. So the US also has an opportunity to play an important role in helping demilitarize the international approach to the region in addition to the US bilateral approach. The second priority is to focus on mitigating current climate shocks and work to prevent future shocks through an equitable global solution to the climate crisis. The US should use new technologies that we identified in the report, like peace rising, that help to identify future climate shocks and so we can target assistance to prevent um, mass displacement and other issues that arise when floods or droughts occur. And invest in things like small scale green technology initiatives that foster entrepreneurship while providing sustainable resources for local communities. The third priority is to address youth disenfranchisement through sustainability. 65% of the population in the Sahel is 30 years old or under. And government human rights abuses, lack of economic opportunity, and other forms of mar marginalization incentivize joining armed groups. The answer is not more bombs from the United States. The answer is increasing local capacity and international solidarity to address these challenges. 
Rather than more security assistance, Congress can spearhead investments by passing legislative vehicles like the Youth Peace and Security Act and the Youth Build International Act, which were introduced last Congress, that focus on providing economic empowerment to youth populations. Of course, this is only a snippet of the findings of this report. It's a very big topic, so I hope you will um, thumb through it and let us know what you think. It provides both more technical as well as broader grand strategy recommendations to move forward in implementing this approach globally. And we think the beauty of this framework is that it can provide an initial roadmap for US engagement globally while still reinforcing the need to tailor policy interventions to local human needs. In closing, I just wanted to highlight the importance of the moment that we're in. For the first time in decades, with one of the largest voter turnouts in the United States in recent history, in the middle of a global pandemic, broad swaths of the US public has sent an unequivocal signal, though there are obviously some who are still failing to hear it, that they want the US to think differently about what security actually means and how the US government can play a positive role in building security for everyday people. To do so, it has to center people in its policy making process and its decisions, especially those most impacted by those decisions, whether at home and abroad. Reforming the US approach to violence writ large and is, is an essential component of centering human security in our federal policy making and foreign policy. And the truly existential crises we face, like the climate crisis in US national security but it will take creative thinking and political will to make it a reality. I'm excited to dig into this more and hear from our other speakers. And we hope that you'll give this a read. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. I think you've given us a lot to think about as we begin this discussion. Um, and I think many of the points you raised are so critical in, in reframing our approach. So um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Matthew Page. Matthew is a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a consultant and co-author of Nigeria, What Everyone Needs to Know. And among his many hats, he's also the unassociate fellow with the Africa program at Chatham House and non-resident fellow with the Center for Democracy and Development in Abuja. Until recently, Matthew was the US intelligence community's top Nigeria expert serving with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Marine Corps Intelligence. He has also served as a Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Africa on the National Intelligence Council. So Matthew, as a former U.S. government intelligence analyst, you have had a bird's eye view on U.S. government engagement in the Sahel over the last several decades. Part of, as Kate was describing, part of what this new report talks about is this reactive, often militarized nature of U.S. atrocity prevention efforts. Could you share some of your insights from your time in government on the success or failures of this military first approach in the region? Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me for the, the panel. Um, yeah, it's hard to, to cram all those observations and, and thoughts from, from a long time kind of inside the belly of the beast, watching how decisions were made and the, and the intelligence um, that informed them. And also, I mean, again, objectively, how many of the people you know, working on these issues in government were trying to do their best and, and trying to navigate the constraints, the policy constraints, the political constraints, the constraints in terms of working with these countries and their militaries, which which can be very difficult and those countries' militaries are, are very difficult partners. And also the difficulty in um, recognizing the signs and predicting you know, mass atrocities and taking intelligence, which needless to say is, is much like the news in our Twitter feeds is sort of a stream of bad and alarming and, and, uh, and, and sort of eyebrow raising material on a daily basis and being able to translate that into you know, what are some real risks in terms of mass atrocities. Um, so as you said, I sort of saw this firsthand as an analyst, you know, focused on West Africa and the Sahel um, from 2003 to 2016, when I left for the think tank world. Um, so I have a few thoughts. First of all, I think, you know, over the period from 2003 onwards, again, wake of 2000, uh, September 11th, um, the creation of the Pan-Sahel Initiative, which was one of the first sort of U.S. Uh, training um, missions and, and engagement programs focus on the Sahel that evolved into the Trans-Sahel Counterterrorism Partnership or TSCTP that people may have heard of. There was a subconscious 
uh, I think, in a gradual militarization of U.S. Sahel policy. Over time, there just came to be a huge disproportionality, if that's a word, between, um, between the sort of um, military component of our engagement in the region and the non-military developmental engagement. And this was something that, again, diplomats and even military officers themselves would sort of freely you know, comment on and observe. And a lot of that, frankly, was driven by sort of appropriation you know, on the Hill, right? Because at the end of the day, the executive branch is kind of just executing the monies and, and a lot of the policy prescriptions that it's given by Congress. Um, so this began during the Bush period and, and proceeded apace under Obama and under Trump. So we have to remember, right, that the failings here, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know hard for all, some of us to say, are, right, are really bipartisan and really institutional, rather than, you know, pointing at a particular set of individuals or political party and saying, you know, this is your sort of, you know, policy failure, own it. Um, the Trump era, ironically, was quite idiosyncratic in the sense that they were very isolationist. They were, they were more skeptical than past administrations about US engagement in the Sahel, but they were also sort of much more authoritarian friendly, right? They, they did not care to think about mass atrocities or the human rights and, and corruption implications of our engagement in the region. So it was sort of a bit of a, a mixed bag. I mean, all in all, quite, quite problematic, but, but different than say, um, you know, previous administrations. So like I mentioned, you know, there was insufficient scrutiny from the Hill throughout this, this period um, and a skewing of appropriations towards military aid, train and equip, foreign military sales, foreign military financing, CT programming of various kinds, rather, and, and a real scaling back, and this goes for sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world as a whole as well, a real scaling back on programming focused on soft power issues like democracy and governance, anti-corruption, non-health development programming, okay? And that's really key because as we know in Sub-Saharan Africa, huge government uh, sort of totemic uh, US government programs focused on health assistance, which is great, but it tends to suck the oxygen out of the room when it comes to, to, to Congress's appetite to fund other, other issues. So I remember at the time, my former boss, Johnny Carson, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, you know, during the uh, beginning of the Obama administration, I mean, he, he sort of lamented that, again, he had an absolutely pittance amount of money in terms of, you know, democracy and government. It's programming that he, as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, had to work with when it came to the government, whereas, you know, DOD and AFRICOM and so forth were awash in money for, for CT programming and, of course, SOCOM, et cetera, et cetera. We won't go into that. Second, quickly, you know, there was, there was a misunderstanding among policymakers at all levels, I think, or a, or a cognitive dissonance, perhaps is a better way to describe it, in terms of the drivers of conflict in the region and flawed assumptions by, again, very well-meaning people, at senior policymakers, bureaucrats and military officials um, about what was going on in the region and, and what the, the causes of that were. And actually, I was just looking over a great Chatham House report, uh, one done by um, uh, an outside uh, researcher, and it's on the Sahel, and, and, the, and one of the first lines is, you know, quote, rather than the ideology, ideology of global jihad, the driving force behind the emergence and resilience of non-state armed groups in the Sahel, again, the guys causing, you know, uh, mass atrocities to occur, is a combination of weak states, corruption, and the brutal repression of dissent embodied in dysfunctional military forces. And again, I didn't write this. This was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, an eminent French scholar on the Sahel. And, um, and again, that hammers home, you know, really what the drivers of this, this conflict are. So there was an unwillingness when problems did occur, like the, the Mali coup, um, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, was a sort of a really big egg on face moment for, for the US in the Sahel when, you know, as I, as I said in a recent press article, when half uh, the, the US trained commando battalion you know, got up, shot and killed the other half of the US trained commando battalion and buried them in the mass grave and overthrew the government, you know, that that obviously is a bit a bit of a, a clear illustrative failure of our, our Sahel policy at the time. Um, and there was really an unwillingness to really look back on sort of what fail, failures were made and, and, and rather again, sort of looking forward on how we can we pick up the pieces and get back to the glory days of last year sort of before this happened. Um, so these old playbooks are sort of dusted off, run again and again without really thought to, to whether or not they're working. Um, and there is this mentality, and I kind of call it the, you know, quote, we must do something mentality, uh, or the yes, but mentality. 
um, when you talk about sort of a do no harm approach. So, you know, you talk to policymakers and you say, yeah, you know, I think there are some problems engaging with this country's military in terms of, you know, the fact that they, uh, you know, conduct mass atrocities themselves, and yet you're supposedly working with them to, to uh, you know, prevent them in the context of, um, you know, a Sahelian conflict. And again, Nigeria and Cameroon are, are really primary examples to this. And, and hopefully in, during the Q&A, people will kind of you know, ping me on that because I, I am happy to sort of talk at, talk at length about some of those specific failures um, embodied in U.S. training and engagement with the Cameroonian military and also embodied in U.S. military assistance and engagement with the Nigerian military, particularly the sale of 12 combat aircraft, which continues to, to work its way through the system. So, so there is this tendency to say, okay, you know, um, our, our policies, you know, aren't working very well, but we kind of have to continue them in the hope that some of the spaghetti that we're throwing at the wall sticks and, and that, you know, right, I guess, um, you know, it's like trying to get a car to start and, you know, continuing to turn the key when it just has spluttered again and again and again. So final thought to wrap up. You know, look, I think all of us or the vast majority of us, right, are, are seeing this through like a moral argument, right? Like mass atrocities are bad, you know, these, you know, US Sahel policy is not designed to, to prevent them and that's bad. But I think there's, and maybe more effectively in terms of our engagement with senior policymakers and, and um, allies on the Hill is the utilitarian argument, right? Which is the current approach is demonstrably ineffective. You know, so and it, and we're we're essentially right wasting money, you know, throwing good money after bad, repeating failures from not learning from mistakes, um, reducing our credibility overseas. However, you want to couch it, right? But but you know, in a sort of fairly you know um, functional functional sense, uh, in the sense that throughout this time when this militarization of U.S. Sahel policy has and international, we should say, right, because the British and French and, and other countries are, are engaged in the region as well, you know, the main drivers of conflict and insurgency are actually getting worse, not better. And in fact, partnering closely with abusive, corrupt, failed governments, um, whose social contract with their citizens has frayed so extensively, without the US engaging in conditioning such engagement on reforms and accountability, leaves these drivers of mass atrocities unaddressed. So, you know, to conclude, right, you know, what does need to happen? And it's pretty simple, right? We need to first do no harm with our, with our Sahel policy. That would be a wonderful start. Rethink and sort of discontinue things that are demonstrably having some pretty negative first and second order effects. And second of all, you know, reprogram some of these funds you know, towards democracy, governance, anti-corruption, poverty alleviation, um, human rights, and, and prioritize those issues, which ultimately are, are what is fueling um, conflict and mass atrocities in the Sahel and elsewhere in the world. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And that's a great lead in for our next speaker, Vahe, um, who comes to us from Peace Direct, which has such a radically different model of how to engage um, in these questions. So I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Vahe Mirikian, um, Assistant Director for U.S. Policy at Peace Direct. Vahe leads Peace Direct's U.S. office with policy and advocacy, where he focuses on youth peace and security, atrocity prevention, countering violent extremism, and locally led peace building. Prior to joining Peace Direct, Vahe worked for Search for Common Ground in the Global Affairs and Partnerships Department, and while there, he focused on peace building in the middle belt of Nigeria, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's also worked for Rep. Adam Schiff uh, on the Hill and holds a master's in international affairs from American University of Paris and a bachelor's in pol politics from St. Mary's College of California. So as I mentioned earlier, Vahe, you know, Peace Direct's model uh, has a potential for civil society engagement and capacity building with a focus on providing flexible funding to local partners. I understand that Peace Direct's work focuses on building local resilience and capacity in context across the conflict curve before, during, after. Um, and so I'm wanting to kind of pose the question to you, what's the importance of the US government 
not only focusing on resolving conflict, conflicts in which we're already apart, but directing uh, resources in this way to countries not yet in crisis. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, everyone else who's gone before me as well. I, I mean, I think to answer that question, I think I first need to begin by explaining Peace Direct, um, you know, how we are radically different in comparison to a lot of other organizations and their approach. Um, for starters, Peace Direct has no country offices. You know, we are um, engaged with partners. We have over 23 partners in 14 countries, um, primarily in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Um, and you know, we we work directly with local organizations. You know, um, I always try to explain this as you know, I my role here with, as the um, assistant director for U.S. policy is the bridge between the um, peace builders and to the policymakers here in the United States government. Um, you know, trying to advocate for their perspectives, their realities, and their needs um, happening. Um, you know, in their respective countries and their respective contexts as well. Um, and, you know, we really provide the resources that they need um, before, like you said, Ursula, the before, the during, and the after of the conflict and really trying to address it. And, you know, it's, there is no one size fits all within these, uh, you know, with, with, from our partners, you know, some of them are working on dread like um, youth, and some of them are working on atrocity prevention, other people are working on so totally drastic and different things, uh, but it's all very appropriate to their country context. Um, and I think that's that's really where the United States can really flourish. And I mean, I want to bring up something that uh, Matthew brought up uh, with the flawed assumptions by uh, senior policymakers of what's happening in the ground context. Um, and this is something that you know uh, happens for a multitude of reasons. Primarily, I believe it's like with the lack of trust um, in happening with the local um, environment. You know, corrupt. There's a, you know corruptions happening. There's a lot of uh, violence happening. A lot of people trying to look out for their own. Um, so there is these uh, assumptions that we have here in Washington, D.C., at the United Nations and other Western governments of the realities of local people and local, um, you know, conflict situations. So I think there, the, that gap needs to be addressed. And through my role in, you know, peace, the, during the before times of the pandemic, you know, Peace Direct would really bring uh, peace builders from um, other countries to the United States to meet with policymakers. And you would really see that gap disappear. Um, that relationship being formed by policymakers here in, in Washington, D.C. and, you know, peace builders from wherever they're coming from, um, in particular from the Sahel in this conversation sake. And, and, you know, they would provide the realities that they're experiencing um, to what the United States can be doing and the United States can tell them what they can be doing and what they are doing. And I think in this case, there has been a, you know, a tilt of tilt of being a very generous word towards you know the over militarization of the foreign policy and, and the engagement um, around the world in particular as well with the Sahel and I think that's uh, very unfortunate because for now like from what we're experiencing from what we're hearing from our partners is their first engagement with the United States is the military and that's very unfortunate because you know our primary ethos is really, you know, democracy, human rights, and all these things, but they're coming first in touch with the military. And I think that's really unfortunate because if we are really going to try to promote these values that we hold so near and dear to ourselves is to come forward with that and engaging in meaningful relationship building with the local people to address all of these root causes. Um, and I think that can be really addressed by bridging that gap somehow, some way. And within that, it's, you know, really recognizing that there is local expertise, you know, these uh, peace builders who are um, really on the front lines or, you know, experiencing, these are their homes. Um, they grew up in the conflict. They understand the complexities and the multifaceted natures of the, what is driving the atrocities that they're facing or the violence that they're facing within the, um, their con context. Um, so I think, we really need to tap into this resource that we really have. And, you know, with coming from that as well, with a lot of the initiatives um, and projects that are being led, whether they're USAID funded or foundation funded or INGO led, um, one of the problems that we see at Peace Direct is that these uh, local people who have the expertise and the insights of really, and the local cultural knowledge, um, you know, to lead and address these um, issues in a sustainable manner, do not have the leeway or the flexibility 
um, you know, to direct it or to design the initiatives that, you know, they um, know so well. So I think that's something uh, that we really need to be addressing as well within, within this is, you know, for locally designed, locally led and locally um, implemented uh, projects and initiatives. And I think that's something that we really try to address here. Um, and I think that's something the United States can do in providing more flexible funding um, for opportunities and for local organizations to even apply for. But too often we see they, they can't even compete with the major implementing partners um, in, the, in the beltway, which is unfortunate. Um, also something to bring up is something that uh, I think Kate mentioned is the importance of including young people. Um, you know, within the youth peace and security agenda at the United Nations and here in the US with the, through the US YPS coalition, you know, trying to codify the, the YPS agenda that started and really gained momentum at the United Nations here through the uh, Youth Peace and Security Act in Congress. Um, I think that's really important thing because too often youth are not only neglected from these peace and security conversations, but they're really scapegoated as the problem that is being caused into the violence. Um, and I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, we, uh, Peace Direct ran a consultation with over 200 youth activists from 60 countries. And we really found that, you know, young people really want to be engaged in the peace building aspect of things and do not want to be engaged um, in the violent aspect of things. And really they, they're seeking these opportunities and these resources to be really involved in it. And you know, an, an extraordinary fact like that we found within our YPS work is that you know one in four young people live in a conflict affected country, um, and, and in these countries themselves, the majority population are youth. And I think that's something that we are not tapping into um, as a government, uh, as a country, or even a sector really. And I think that's something that is missing within these processes. So. Um, I think I will kind of leave it there as far as what we can do as far as just really engaging with the young people, um, really engaging with the locally led expertise that is there that is not addressed and addressing the trust and funding issues um, and gap that is there. So I can leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Vahe. Um, and I think that really kind of ties a bow on everything Matthew was saying, as well as Kate, in terms of new approaches and sort of not repeating the, the mistakes of the past. So as we wait for questions to come in through the Q&A, which I encourage all of our audience um, to, to drop questions in the Q&A, um, I wanted to start out by just asking, what's the one thing, if the US did something differently tomorrow to build or support sustainable peace in the region to prevent mass atrocities, what's the one thing you would like the US to do differently tomorrow? Um, and I'll start with you, Vahe. I'll go in kind of reverse order. Um, sorry, so you're asking what we can do for tomorrow, like in the future going forward? I, I mean, I really think it's really just exactly what I said. It's sort of, you know, including young people within our foreign policy um, objectives, really trusting and making those authentic relationships with um, local leaders, local peace builders, human rights activists and humanitarians um, and developing those relationships and including their perspectives and analyses within our foreign policy decision making. Uh, but on top of that, um, you know, in the spirit of this panel and this discussion in the report is really demilitarizing our approach, you know, instead of leading with our military, leading with weapons, you know, leading with our developments and civilian agencies, I think that is, you know, something that's important. I think too often now we really see, for example, our embassies are even guarded up to the teeth. And, you know, unfortunately, our, you know, diplomats aren't out there like they used to be, you know, engaging and developing those relationships and understanding those insights. And I think that's, you know, an unfortunate reality that we're experiencing that can be easily addressed, you know, welcoming, being more welcome uh, to other people outside. So I think that could be a starting point as well. Thank you. Great point. Matthew? Well, this is a tough question. The old wave, your, you know, if you could wave your magic wand, what would you do? Uh, so I sort of, if I looked panicked there for a minute, that was that was why. Um, so I think, you know, I came up with sort of two, two clear answers. One is, you know, shift from an appropriation standpoint, shift money out of DOD programs into into USAID and program that money to sustain civil society groups, you know, and and entities, you know, like Vahe's that are, you know, 
you know, our, our building capacity within that sector, you know, our, our relationships with these countries have become so myopically government to government focused. And part of that is that security issue. We're not able to travel outside. And, you know, part of it is our natural bias towards, you know, spending way more time, as I say, in the dimly lit corridors of government ministries rather than sort of engaging, engaging with real people outside the bubble of the capital. Um, and there are reasons for that, but I think, again, diplomats fall into that trap um, too often, or at least I, I certainly saw that, you know, was the case um, in, in, in my interactions with the State Department. The other, I think, gets at some of this uh, conditionality that I was talking about. And, and really that conditionality is about changing incentives because the problem in the region, and this is across, you know, this is to varying degrees across the different countries um, in the region is conflict has sort of become a monetizable um, commodity for elites in the region. Violence in Northeastern Nigeria is a great example. You know, the conflict in Northern Cameroon, um, you know, uh, counterterrorism in Mali and Niger. So um, you know, these governments have basically used sort of the mass, you know, the mass for militarization of their own domestic policy as a reason, as, as in a sense, inoculating themselves against criticisms from their own population that they're failing to deliver on public goods and development and, you know, and other issues. And so um, basically, and this, I see this a lot in Nigeria because that's what I focus, you know, 99.9% .9 of my attention on is, you know, the security and political elites are, are becoming very wealthy on the continuation of, of conflict. And they're able to monetize this because of, you know, um, their, their ability to, to translate those sort of corrupt behaviors into, you know, into cash and to, and to enjoy that cash in places like Dubai and London and New York with relative impunity. So, so what the U.S. really needs to think about is how you know, corruption prevention and, re and refocusing U.S. policy in the region on human rights and corruption will change those incentives and is in itself an effective counterterrorism strategy in the way in which their current, um, again, training and engagement focus is not. Because you can train and engage with people till the cows come home and it's, it's fine. And it's and typically in and of itself, that sort of behavior is relatively harmless, right? Um, it you know, it's good that if these guys are going to be carrying guns and patrolling, right, that they kind of know how to do that. But it's it's never going to be sufficient to really change outcomes on the ground. Whereas preventing that, you know, those set of corrupt elites at the top of the military and the political establishment from essentially, you know, gaining off of the, the chaos and uh, immiseration of the populace and, you know, the mass atrocities that are the symptom of that, because I would argue that, again, you know, it's hard to profit directly off a of mass atrocity typically in the, in the moment, but the mass atrocity is sort of the, the consequence of that breakdown in the rule of law. You know, we have, to, we have to get a better grip on that and realize that that's the driver of the problem and not you know, the inability of your, your average Malian soldier to shoot straight. Thank you, I think that's an excellent point. And Kate? Um, so I'll also take the opportunity to answer one um, question in the uh, chat as well in my answer and get a little bit more technical in that um, in the time frame of tomorrow, the Biden administration is going to be issuing their presidential budget request, or at least the quote unquote skinny version soon, maybe tomorrow. Um, but I think that that the budget, right, really spells out an administration's priorities. And I think it's incredibly important for the executive branch at this point, given all that has gone on over the last four, but also the really the last 20 years, to submit a presidential budget request that cuts the Pentagon budget by, you know, there's proposals from, uh, you know, we propose in the report 200 billion to 350 billion per year, and then reinvest those resources, not only domestically, but in doubling the State Department's budget, right? And really providing not only the resources to really rebuild their department, but also as part of that, I think, prioritize these alternative, more creative approaches that the majority of these departments aren't ne necessarily forwarding in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and so in terms of specific accounts, I think it's important to look at um, the Complex Crises Fund at USAID, um, as well as the new Conflict uh, Stabilization Peace 
Prevention and Stabilization Bureau at USAID, that's its specific mandate is peace building. And I think, you know, they have a, I think their budget is, it's, you know, 80 million, maybe it's very small compared to, you know, the nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars we're spending on the Pentagon and nuclear weapons budget each year. And so I think that um, the budget is an opportunity for the rubber to meet the road and to really signal to Congress who has expressed interest, but I think needs to be pushed that this could be the right move to make right in their upcoming appropriation season, that change really is necessary and the time to start rethinking how we fund security is now. That's great. And I will just build off that briefly to say the um, atrocity prevention line item in SFOPS is only $5 million. Um, and I think if we knew next year, there was the potential for another Rohingya crisis, another Rwanda, another um, you know, uh, Balkans, we would be spending a lot more than $5 million. Um, and we have signals, <laughs> we have lots of signals that atrocities are on the horizon. Um, so to all of our friends in Congress who are listening, um, you know, the Prevention and Protection Working Group this year is asking to quintuple that to a whopping $25 million, um, which is still just so far below what's really needed to prevent mass atrocities. But this is going to that new approach of nonviolent solutions um, to, to preventing mass atrocities. So kind of building a little bit on this and taking a few of the questions that have gone in the chat together, you know, I think there's a lot of questioning about if we keep seeing failures happening, we keep documenting the failures, why aren't things happening differently? Why hasn't the administration, you know, the different departments and agencies taken up a new approach to preventing mass atrocities? Um, I think I'll start with Matthew and then maybe go to Kate. Yeah, this is a really good question, um, and it's um, it's one I think about a lot. I think there there are a few reasons, and again, it's not uh, I, you know I wouldn't question the the motivations or um, you know character right of the people who are involved in making these decisions because I worked you know with so many of them and they're grappling with these and and some obviously grapple with them more effectively than others, um, and and so it's it's interesting to see how how people do react differently in these in these meetings or moments where where you're being presented with these really tough tough calls. Um, ironically, I think the more senior someone is and the more global their focus, you know, at that sort of um, you know undersecretary, deputy secretary level, you, you know, or or NSC sort of um, level they're actually much more dispassionate and, and they tend to make better decisions when it comes to these issues. It tends to be the working level, right? Where people have a lot more vested interests or they're defending organizational interests or, you know, the embassy says this, so they're defending that position because, you know, they're, they're loyal to sort of the embassies and the ambassadors take on a particular issue and that can be counterproductive. Um, so there's a general lack of continuity and expertise, right? I mean, it's rare when you have someone who's working an issue more than a few years. And so, you know, they're often, you know, not necessarily, and I'm not saying that, you know, again, I'm not trying to be like the, you know, whatever quintessential expert is like, yes, you know, you have to be working on an issue for 20 years before you know what you're talking about. No, but I mean, just generally like with policy, it helps to have, and it's more about policy memory rather than, you know, what the capital of Nigeria is. It's more about like, hey, didn't we do something on this like, you know, five years ago? And how did that end? And I was constantly, as even as an intelligence analyst, sort of whispering to the policymaker and even like forwarding them emails from their predecessors three years ago, being like, hey, similar conversation, similar decision, here's, here's the outcome. And this often happened right in terms of like human rights vetting and again agonizing over some of these soft power issues as they it, as they mattered for sort of um, security sector assistance or mass atrocities prevention or what have you. Another issue I saw, and apologies if I'm going on too long on this, was the interpretation of high level guidance. So a good example is the Bring Back Our Girls uh, episode in Nigeria in, in 2014, where you had an extremely high level, you know, prior to the abduction of the girls, there was a lot of concern at the very highest levels from President Obama on down about Nigerian army abuses, including, you know, the, the mass killing of detainees at Nigerian army prison camps, which still continues to this day, but, you know, 
who, you know, uh, that's that's neither here nor there, I guess. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was a lot of agonizing about this. And then when the girls were abducted, the narrative sort of changed. And, it became, and again, it wasn't because of bad intentions. They're just like, hey, we've got to do everything we can to bring back these girls, you know, whatever help the Nigerian military needs, you know, provide it to them, you know, so there was that that mentality. And again, immediate militarization of, you know, not, hey, why did this happen? You know, what are the drivers of a mass abduction, a mass atrocity, essentially? Um, and and how can we prevent that? So that was that was the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction. Um, and then there's also the incentives of the players within the systems. And I'm thinking particularly within, you know, when we're talking about ambassadors and defense attaches and how, you know, again, the incentives for them in terms of how they're appraised and how they get promoted or how, how they get, you know, view their own reputations is how much, you know, how closely do they work with the host nation government? You know, how much assistance do they provide? You know, what are, what are they doing? You know, what, what bridges are they building? Not how many conversations are they having where they go into the, you know, chief of defense staff and selling country X and say like, sorry, you know, you're a bunch of big corrupt human rights abusers. We're not going to work with you or, you know, we're going to withdraw this type of assistance. You know, that, that to them is sort of antithetical to what they're put there for. And so they're very resistant to any sort of um, external information that makes what they perceive to be their primary job more difficult to do. And then finally, um, well, I talked about the appropriation cycles and how, you know, again, a lot of the, the sort of militarization is driven by spending money that's been budgeted and spending that sort of by the end of the FY, by however means possible, you know, getting it out the door truly. Um, but the final thing I would say in terms of how do we stop you know, the sort of um, Groundhog Day approach, right, to to U.S. Sahel policy. And that is, I think, and maybe I'm naive, but I think that doing sort of like some independent cost-benefit analysis, you know, writing really good reports that really sort of, in a sense, are mirrors that you hold up to policymakers and say, like, the emperor has no clothes, you know, done by external research groups like Civic or, or you know, like the work I do at Carnegie in terms of, you know, uh, anti-corruption policy, um, these are effective because they kind of they kind of get out there in the public domain and then people kind of can't uh, basically ignore them. Like I felt sometimes right within the intelligence community, sort of inconvenient reports because they're classified or assessments can kind of get shoveled to one side or forgotten about over time. Whereas stuff that's in the public domain has a bit of a longer shelf life and can be used by advocacy entities over and over again, including ones like Vahe, you know, um, works with who are who are locally based, you know. So sorry, I went on too long there. No, that was really great. Um, Kate? Um, no, I really appreciated those insights, um, Matthew. I think like I'll take a step back and um, bring it more to like, I think, the grand strategy reasons why we probably are kind of having this Groundhog Day approach. Um, it's interesting too, because I think it's being recognized more and more and that's a good thing, right? And one of the opportunities that is presented with us in the future. But I think part of it is the fact that for so long, US national security within government at kind of the more the highest levels, particularly over the last 30 years really has been driven by this idea that US security is based on maintaining hegemony around the world. And what hegemony is, is basically that we have military dominance around the world. Um, and I think that because of that mentality, right, that incentivizes spending at the Pentagon, creating weapon systems, all of these things that we need that to quote unquote control and dominate um, any other potential military adversary. And I think that that's distracted us from the challenges that everyday people face um, around the world and just meeting their basic physical, economic, and psychosocial security, right? And ultimately, I think that coupled with, um, or has reinforced really the like misperception of potential political costs of taking early action to actually try something out that is non-military that might take longer to show results, but actually is driven by locally informed decision makers, right, who have the context that we need to really design um, these programs effectively as Vahe was talking about. And I think what, what we try to pull out at the, in the report is one of the reason that those political, that misperception exists in terms of the costs, I think, is that 
the U.S. has kind of taken this approach of trying to muddle through things, right? We want to have global hegemony, but we don't necessarily want to be responding to every single thing that could happen in the world because we have all of these other crises that we need to manage. And what happens then is that things kind of get pushed off the priority list, like Matthew was talking about, and things get pushed down because they're not at the level of crisis. And then what happens is that a crisis emerges and suddenly there's all this external political pressure to do something because we can't just sit and do nothing. We're Again, it's related to this perception of us as the sole superpower that has military hegemony and therefore we should be able for some reason to control events in faraway places. And I think that in that scenario, the political cost then of doing nothing or taking a diplomatic approach or targeting, you know, programming resources to local civil society tends to be viewed to have higher political costs than just dropping some bombs and saying, look, we did something. There's been accountability here, even though in the long term, that often just fuels conflict versus actually um, mitigating and terminating a conflict. And so I think that's where, you know, the we want to reinforce, especially in this moment where you have, you know, the US government's constituents asking for a new way to build security. It shouldn't just be limited to how we build security here at home. It has to be a new approach to how we build it abroad. And I think pulling out the fact that these perceived costs of taking early action are much, much lower than when you get to this crisis decision point of trying to be like, well, you know, what type of tomahawk missiles should we use versus we're just not, we're going to ignore it or say this is bad and then not do anything tangible in terms of accountability. So, you know, I, the other thing I just want to pull out too is I think that it's also related to the fact that the U.S. itself doesn't necessarily want to be held accountable for some of the harms that its policies has created in the past. And I think that lack of willingness to hold itself accountable to the same rules that it's trying to hold others accountable just undermines our ability and our credibility to actually use our leverage and influence as it exists to actually see the behavioral change that we want to see. Yeah, that's an excellent point at the end. Um, and I, I see the question that came in about the ICC and ICJ and, you know, our continuing sanctions of uh, investigators who are looking at our potential for atrocities in the war in Afghanistan. I think really pointedly shows that um, that we like to, to hold others to an account accountability level that we are afraid of ourselves. Um, I did uh, also just want to mention two quick things before we go to the final question. One, um, unfortunately, we did have uh, a local uh, Sahelian colleague who was planning to join us today to bring that local voice as part of this conversation. But unfortunately, internet issues um, prevented them from participating and Unfortunately, as we've seen in this era of Zoom, it's great. You can bring people from around the world and unfortunately also brings a lot of questions around infrastructure development and where um, video conferencing is easy and less easy. Um, lastly, I also just want to mention, we have made note of all of your questions and um, When Without War will be following up by email um, because you know we've had so many great questions that could take us an entire hour to answer any one of them. Um, and so I wanted to wrap up with just a little bit of a positive note <laughs> after an hour of discussing um, a little difficult of a subject. And I wanted to turn it to Vahe to ask you to speak a little bit about where have we seen success from this different approach? Where have we seen whether on a small or a large scale things go differently because we put local um, communities at the center of our response and we, we leaned into the development and the diplomacy side of the equation. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very important question, um, especially when we are looking for like examples, you know, the billion dollar question of like, how do you prove prevention? Um, and, you know, moving forward of like, what is really effective? Um, I think one of the, the big things that, you know, within Peace Tyrex approach that we have found very successful and uh, one of the, the big things that we, um, you know, promote is the kind of convening power of bringing local organizations together and doing learning exchanges, whether it's uh, within country or cross country or, you know, just regional or international and bringing in together people, um, you know, to really learn from each other as far as what they're doing, what can be done, how can they work together if necessary, um, you know, what are the major issues being done. And I think that's something that 
um, could be easily done from the U.S. government perspective or, you know, even USAID of making these relationships with um, local organizations and bringing them together to develop those relationships, but also learn from them to see what they're doing and how can, you know, the U.S. government's work complement their work rather than contradict their work. Um, and I think that's something that is important to, um, you know, explore um, to do. The other thing is, you know, really just like the inclusivity of funding. Um, you know, one um, a couple of examples I can give, you know, um, as, you know, Ursula was mentioning, you're trying to bring in this era of Zoom, um, the opportunities of really bringing in local people. And, I, and that's something that Peace Direct has been really trying to do. Um, you know, it's a lot cheaper for us. We don't have to, you know, buy plane tickets and hotel rooms and, you know, bring getting visas and doing all that hassle just for trying to bring them to the United States. Um, you know, we can get them a Zoom link. Um, but that also, you know, assumes that, you know, these peace builders and these local people have access to the internet or have the equipment that they, you know, require to get on Zoom itself. And through that, you know, um, you know, with Humanity United, Peace Direct was able to create and launch a digital inclusion fund where, you know, we provided very, very micro grants. Um, by micro grants, I'm not talking about like the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. I'm talking like a few hundred dollars uh, for people to buy laptops or, you know, access to internet and, you know, stuff like that to transfer their peace building work online, like m many of us have, the, have had the luxury to do. Um, so I think that's really, uh, you know, providing that inclusivity and access as well um, is really important. And it's great to see, you know, especially with a lot of the local peace builders uh, to say, you know, especially, you know, in in-country context, peace building is done in person and during a pandemic that's been very difficult. So, you know, giving them that access to online and transferability has been huge and it's been receiving a lot of positive feedback as far as, you know, their work being able to continue and move forward, which is important as far as addressing the causes and preventing violence or even atrocities from even happening. So I think there's that. And then another example is within our Youth Action uh, for Peace program that we have in four countries, but in relevance to this conversation with the Sahel in Mali and Central African Republic, um, is we work with youth or youth led organizations um, who are uh, who have a vast network of other youth coalitions, movements and other organizations um, around their specific country, and they can provide them micro grants um, for, you know, six months to a year or even longer, uh, depending on what the program are doing. But I think that inclusion for funding to launch initiatives has been huge uh, for a lot of youth who may or may not have access to funding directly to grant makers, to foundations. Um, and I think that's been uh, very important to including them uh, within that process. And, you know, that's been something that's been very much missing um, within, I, you know, I believe within the U.S. government and USAID grant making processes and State Department is just access for local organizations to bid for uh, grants and win grants because, you know, it, the entire process in itself is just so cumbersome and requires expertise, knowledge expertise, uh, to language expertise, to even just understanding how the entire grant making process happens. Um, so this inclusivity is, is has been huge for us to provide some of the funding for um, youth led organizations in these countries and something that can be very much replicated um, to whether it's through INGOs or directly to um, youth uh, local organizations themselves. So I think, I know we're coming up on time, so I think I'm gonna leave it there for now. Thank you so much. And thank you so much um, to all of our panelists. Um, as we wrap up today's discussion, of course, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and expertise today. Also thanking all of our attendees. Um, I really appreciate your participation and for joining us today. Um, once again, you can find the link to Win Without War's full report on their website at winwithoutwar.org. And if you're interested in joining the Prevention and Protection Working Group, you can also find that at fcnl.org slash ppwg. And thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate uh, your time this morning for an important discussion. Thanks, everyone.